I just wanted to begin in prayer, um, and tonight let's just pray the um, St. Michael prayer together. Um, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits, who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. St. Scholastica, Scholastica, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, her, her feast day her is tomorrow, so we'll keep her in our thoughts. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about um, part two on our facts and fictions uh, topics, part two from last week. But as with the Crusades, many people bring up the Inquisition as a dark stain on the Catholic Church history. And so people will use this as a time of scandal and immorality and sin of the Church. And just as with the Crusades last week, there are many myths and misconceptions still being promoted even today. And I'm sure many of you heard, even our um, current president made a reference to it last week. And so in his prayer breakfast, he was making a comment to Christians to, tr to try to show Christians that Muslims were not alone in committing hor horrific acts in the name of God. And so last week, President Obama said, and he's referring to the brutality of Islam, how do we reconcile these realities? And then he went on, lest we get on our high horse and think this is unique, remember that during the Crusades and the Inquisition, people committed terrible deeds in the name of Christ. And so when I read this, I was like, wow, this is perfect timing for us to be talking about these two things because he's, he seems to believe a lot of these misconceptions that are promoted about the Crusades. And then tonight, I think, at the end, you'll also see a lot of the myths and misconceptions about the Inquisition, as it's commonly referred to. But I think it's important, as we did last night, or last week, to really look at the accurate information, look at the context, look at what the contemporaries were saying at the time, and then really use that to make a, a true evaluation of what happened. To get started this week, I'm going to do what we did last week. We're going to have a couple comments, and I want you to raise your hand if you think it's fact or fiction. And feel free to raise your hand. Hopefully by the end of the night you'll know all the answers. But the first comment, from the 1200s to the 1600s, there was one tribunal organization across Europe led by the Catholic Church called the Inquisition. How many of you think this is fact? Just raise your hand. And then how many of you think it's fiction? Okay, it's fiction. We'll, we'll talk about that. The Inquisition was a term describing the legal process invented by the church to investigate heretics. How many of you believe this is fact? Just raise your hand if you think it's fact. And how many of you believe it's fiction? Okay, it's fiction. We'll explain that here in a minute. It wasn't invented by the church. Um, the next comment. By the end of the Spanish Inquisition, so after about 350 years, there are more than 50 million people who had been sentenced to being burned at the stake. How many of you believe this is fact? And how many believe it's fiction? It's fiction, although it's commonly promoted even today. One way used to persuade the heretics to repent was to threaten imprisonment. The prisons were dun dungeons with torture chambers, and they aroused great fear, leading many to reconciliation with just this threat alone. How many of you think it's fact? And how many think it's fiction? It's fiction. During the 1200s to the 1600s, heresy was seen as a crime worse than murder, even by the secular authorities. How many of you believe this is fact? And how many of you believe it's fiction? Fact. During the 1200s to the 1600s, people lived in fear of the church's inquisitors. How many believe this is fact? And how many believe it's fiction? It's fiction. The papal office of the Inquisition established in the church in Rome in 1588 still exists today. How many believe it's fact? And how many believe it's fiction? 
fact. All right. So we'll by the end, like I said, you'll, you'll know the an answers and understand the facts and the fictions amongst all this. Last week we briefly reviewed the history of Christendom and from the time of Christ to the time of the Crusades, if you remember that. And so last week when looking at history, I emphasized that it's really important when we look at past events and past things that we cannot try to measure the events of the past with today's standards. We have to evaluate the context and that's very critical. And we also want to look at what did the contemporaries think about what was happening and then we also have to make sure we have accurate information. So the time period we're going to focus on tonight is the 12th to the 18th centuries. And so we're going to hear but that it's during this time that the Catholic Church had her Inquisition. But in reality, the Inquisition is a legal procedure and it was adopted from something that had been developed during the time of the Roman Empire. So before we can really start to talk about the 12th to 18th centuries, we have to go back 800 years to really look at what had happened in the Roman Empire even before the time of Christianity became legal. So without going into any detail, there's a lot of different methods that existed during the Roman Empire to bring a person to trial. So you'd have an accused person and you'd bring them to trial in various ways. By the third and the fourth century, they had developed a legal procedure referred to as the inquisitio, or we may say the inquiry process. And what would happen would be you would have an official magistrate appointed by the emperor and he would be given the charge of going and investigating evidence or accusations or suspicions to determine whether or not there was enough evidence and if there was that person would be charged and brought to trial. This was part of Roman law that had developed. The trial did include an element of torture but that would be used in the Roman Empire to get a confession from someone if it was needed. It was not necessarily needed, but it, would, it was a part of that judicial process to being able to s obtain a confession if it was needed. Now the death penalty was also a possibility during this time under the Roman Empire. And so the person would be investigated under the process of the inquisitio or the inquisitorial procedure. They would be charged if there was enough evidence, brought to trial, and then sentenced. The penalties varied based on the crime. For an example, if someone committed the act of treason against the Roman Empire, that they often were sentenced to death. That was often received the death penalty. But different penalties received different, cri uh, different crimes were given, received different penalties. Now one thing that's interesting is in the Roman Empire, heresy was equated to treason because the Roman Empire saw that whatever religion we believe to be true, then if you're opposed to that religion, you're opposed to the empire. And so they saw that dissent or opposition to the religion, which, whatever that may be, was e equated with being treasonous to the empire. And if someone was found guilty of heresy in the Roman Empire, they would receive d various fines, various penalties. It could be fines, confiscation of goods, exclusion from an inheritance, and then potentially even the death penalty. So a variety of, of penalties were given. Now if you recall, by the end of the fourth century, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so what we see happening is that heretics to Christianity could potentially be investigated and charged by the state, and they could be punished. So from the 4th to the 6th centuries, we see that as soon as the church or her councils would make a declaration about a particular doctrine, then anyone who held otherwise potentially could be investigated and charged by the empire, by the state, and potentially could be given the death penalty or one of the other penalties for heresy. Now during this time, the 4th and 6th centuries, during the time of the Roman Empire, what did the church believe about heresy and how did, the, how did the church feel about the state and the state's punishments? Well, the Christians used scripture to, to really understand heresy. And in two, many passages, particularly two we're going to look at, in Titus chapter 3, verses 9 to 11, St. Paul is talking to Titus, and if you use the Greek, he's referring to schismatics and heretics, basically people who cause division and dissent. And he tells Titus and the Christians that if people are causing division and dissent, you talk to them, encounter them, try to persuade them 
Give them at least two attempts to try to change their mind, and if you can't, you avoid them. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17, we also see that it says, if your brother sins against you, and then it, get, it tells you to make three different attempts to try to help bring that person back to the church, and if they refuse, then you treat them as an apostate. So basically, they should be excommunicated. So the church viewed heresy as something that was very dangerous, very serious, and at a minimum, if you've made a couple attempts to try to help convince them that they're wrong, then you avoid them if they continue to remain obstinate, and the church should ex excommunicate them. And so the church did these things, but the church also saw that the Roman Empire, the state, the penalties were in many ways too severe because the church wanted to save souls. If we just found someone guilty and charged them of heresy and then gave them the death penalty without instructing them, without teaching them, we weren't really trying to save their soul. So the church developed her own variation of the inquisitorial procedures during the Roman Empire to investigate heresy herself and then she would make charges and sentences and, and give them penalties. But her first step in addressing heresy was always education and instruction because truth was persuasive and if we can show people the truth, hopefully it will get them to turn, turn back to the church and reconcile. So the church always wanted to emphasize instruction and persuasion to get them back to, into the church. Now one could incur various penalties and so that the church could give punishment uh, canonical sanctions, so excommunication, or if they were in a monastic community or a religious community, they could be expelled. If they held public office, the church could dismiss them. Um, and then there's other things the church would do. And then the church would try everything she could to instruct them, persuade them, get the heretic back in communion with the church. And if she failed, then she would hand the heretics over to the state as a last resort. The church never did, nor could she give the death penalty during the time of the Roman Empire. That was only something the state could do, but the church knew that often if she handed them over, that may be one of the consequences for the heretic that was handed over to the state. Now, St. Augustine even refers to this, and he, he despised the empire's penalties, but he acknowledged that there were times when the heretic needed to be handed over if there was nothing else the church could do, because the church needed to also protect the community from this heretic. And so they despised the penalties, but sometimes they felt it was necessary to hand them over. So what we see happening is during the 4th to the 6th centuries, this is taking place in the Roman Empire. And over time, with heresy being char punished by the state and by the church, heretics became less and less openly expressive of, of their heresies. And so you don't see them as much, though they're still there. But the, the most drastic change comes, if you remember from last week, at the end of the 5th century, whenever the Roman Empire in the West falls because of all the different barbarian invaders coming into the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire in the West is going to fall. And so when that happens, there just becomes great turmoil in the West. And so there's social, political, and economic instability with all these different barbarian in invaders coming in. So with this, the church really has to turn her focus and her attention on some other things that become priorities. Number one is helping to unify the, the people in the West. All these different barbarian tribes and kingdoms that are coming in and establishing themselves, the church has to build unity and the church also now has to evangelize the barbarians. So that really becomes a big focus for her at this point. So with that, we jump to the 10th and 11th centuries. And so throughout these next several hundred years, this is really what's happening in the West, in the Roman, the, what was the Roman Empire in the West. In the 10th and 11th centuries, we see the church starting to form closer and closer alliances with the different secular governments to build unity for stability and for protection because the threat of outside invaders continues to be very real and very dangerous. So the, the barbarians, the Muslims, and others are continuing to attack the West, the people in the West. So the church is building alliances. But there's also turmoil within the church. There's also a lot of turmoil within the church in the 10th and 11th century. So the church starts to see clerical abuses. There's immorality among the bishops, the priests, and even all the way to the top. Some of the, the popes during this time do commit some acts of immoralities and sin. This is also a time where you see more than one person claiming to be the valid pope. So you can, you can see that all there's, there's outside turmoil and then within the church there's a lot of chaos. The result of this ends up people start to 
be opposed to the church and dissenting from the church. And so we're going to see a rise of heresies in the 10th and 11th centuries. And so the church, in response to this, establishes what's called the Episcopal Visitation. And so the Pope will say that every bishop has a duty to travel throughout the diocese to any place where there's suspicion of heresy and visit there on a regular basis and find local officials to help identify those who are suspected of heresy so the bishop can then address them. This is overall ineffective. And so the church has to make another action to try to help address heresy. And that's going to bring us to the 12th century. But before we really talk about what the church did, we have to stop and say what was life like in the 12th through the 15th centuries because it is very important in establishing our, our context when we start to talk about the Inquisitions. So this is a period that's called the High and Late Middle Ages. During this time, the church and the state were separate, but they were intertwined. They both shared a common foundation. They both shared a common aim, and that was protecting uh, the common good. And so when we look at secular authorities specifically during this time, Christianity was the major religion of the majority of those in the West. So what is present day Europe? What was the Western em Roman Empire? So Christianity is the major religion. The state recognized that there was a common foundation with the church. And so as a result, secular politics were not theologically or morally neutral. So any time a law was being made, a political question rose to the surface, they had to look at the theological perspective. And when laws were made, they didn't, they looked, laws could not be made without looking at m morality in the eyes of God. So things were not neutral like they are today in many ways. The good of the church was seen as being important to the state. The state saw that there was a good to protect the orthodox faith for several reasons. One, for unity of the people. Another important thing was just protecting the common good as a whole. The faith was seen as not being only unifying, but it was true. It was the reality of the world. And so the, the state saw her duty to protect that faith because it was unifying, helped the common good, and it was true. And then not only that, many of the kings in the West felt that their kingships were God-given. And so, as such, they saw that any dissent from the faith was an indirect attack on their kingship. And so the state saw protecting the faith to be a good and to be very important. And heresy disrupted all four of these things. Heresy brought division. Heresy damaged the society. Heresy attacked um, truth because it was spreading falsehoods. And then heresy attacked the kingship. And so it brought nothing but unrest and rebellion. So the state had a, had a in particular interest in addressing heresy. Now also during this time, let's look at the people, the worldview, the mindset of the people during the, the High and, and Late Middle Ages. For the people during this time, religion was not a private matter. It was not something people just did on Sundays. It was an abiding and universal truth. The prevalent idea we have today of truth being relative would have shocked them. That would have been very shocking to them. They also emphasized proper ordering of the Christian life. There was a heightened consciousness of the quest for eternity. So their lives revolved around everything was ordered to God and their goal was heaven. And that's how they lived. They saw that the Christian faith was not just something you believed, it was something you lived. This is just a painting of a liturgical procession <clears throat> in front of a cathedral, uh, just kind of showing some of the things that would happen at that time. But historian Thomas Madden wrote about the people who lived during this time. He said, for people who lived during those times, religion was not something one just did at church. It was science, philosophy, politics, identity, and hope for salvation. It was not a personal preference but an abiding and universal truth. Heresy then struck at the heart of that truth. It doomed the heretic, endangered those near him, and tore apart the fabric of community. The people also saw that the church was a gift from God. 
It was a gift given to protect and pass on the truths that Christ revealed to us. And so the people wanted to protect the faith at all costs. And to the people, heresy was a crime more dangerous than murder. And the secular authorities recognize this as well. And why is that? Well, because heresy doesn't just destroy the flesh, it also destroys the soul. And this is just consistent with what Jesus told us. Jesus said, you should be more afraid of him who can destroy your soul than of him who can destroy your body. And they took that very seriously. That if heresy affected one's soul and one's eternal life. Plus it also damaged not only the heretic, but people around him and the community. People also recognized that because one's spiritual life was not private, and the state of one's soul was more important than the state of one's flesh, the government had a duty to protect the spiritual welfare of its citizens. The people also believed that if they did nothing about heresy, it would spread and take root, and not only that, it would bring down the wrath of God on both the faithful and the heretics alike. And they, they took this very seriously. <coughs> And so as a result, you can see that both the secular authorities and the people, having these mindsets they did, felt they had every good reason to find and destroy heretics wherever they could find them. Because heretics were traitors, not only to God, but to the king. And they were very disruptive to society, and they were very dangerous. One of the responses the secular authorities are going to have is they're going to develop, the they're going to revive the inquisitorial process procedures from the time of the Roman Empire. So they're going to bring those back so that inquisitorial process will be revived and that they're going to use that to address heresy and dissent among the, the, among the, 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 during this time of the Middle Ages. And again, you're going to start to see the secular authorities are going to again begin to equate heresy with treason. And they're going to start, to, more and more over time, they're going to start to give death penalty as the sentence for heretics. And as, res, as a response for the people, what they're going to start to also do is develop lynch mobs. They're going to start to take justice into their own hands. And that's the response of the governments and the people to heresy at first. Now what about the church? What is she doing at this time during the Middle Ages? Well, the church definitely recognized the dangers of heresy. It was a threat to everyone. But the church also said that heretics were lost sheep and they've strayed from the flock. And as bishops and, as, and the Pope, they have a duty as shepherds to bring the people back to the flock. And so that was the church's role, to bring them back and do everything you could to, to bring them back into the fold. And so the church felt it was good that the secular leaders are trying to help address heresy and they would actually encourage them to do that, to help us address heresy because it is important. But the church saw that these secular penalties were too severe and over time they just continued to get more and more severe with the death penalty becoming more and more frequent for heresy. So the church wanted to develop her own ways of addressing heresy and she wanted to make sure it was articulated that the ultimate goal is to save souls. And so with this, the church is going to revive her own version of the inquisitorial procedure. So she's going to revive her own version of the inquisition to address heresy. And she's going to try to give heretics a chance to escape death, to escape the death penalty, and to be reconciled with the church. And so that's how those three different groups of, of, people, of people, the people, the secular authorities, and the church are going to start to look at heresy. Now let's look, let's, refer, look, let's look specifically at the Inquisition. So first we're going to be talking about the, the first part we're going to talk about is the 12th to the 15th centuries. At this time there was no one organization or one tribunal that called itself the Inquisition. The idea that something, an institutionalized Inquisition developed doesn't happen until the late 1400s. And then you'll start to see the Spanish Inquisition develop or the Roman Inquisition develop. There'll also be one in Portugal, one in Venice, Venice and others. But the idea of an institutionalized body that was just one Inquisition is, is not true. That's inaccurate. During the 12th to the 15th centuries, there were many Inquisitions that occurred. Both that were overseen by the church and then some that were separate and overseen by the secular authorities. And then even once the Protestant Reformation happens, Protestant countries will also have their own forms of the Inquisition. So there really wasn't one Inquisition. 
It was not invented by the church. As I mentioned, it was a revival of something that had been developed under the Roman Empire, under Roman law. And then the church and the secular authorities are going to revive it and, and develop their own variations of it, but it, wasn't invented by, it was not invented by the church. And again, there wasn't one, and so really we should always refer to this in the plural. The Inquisitions really would be more accurate. And so a lot of times when people say the Inquisition, it already starts to hint, suggest to me they probably don't know the full history of this and they probably have some underlying misconceptions because it was really plural. And then as I mentioned in the high and late Middle Ages, both the church and the governments had this in many, in many areas. It wasn't throughout Europe, but it was in many places. Now the term inquisition comes from this term inquisitio, which basically means to investigate or have an inquiry. And then the term inquisitor would come from this. And this was a judicial process. And you would have an appointed official who is supposed to look at the evidence or suspicions or accusations and see whether or not there's enough evidence to bring a particular person to trial. Now when we look at the church's inquisition specifically, the pope or the local bishops would appoint the inqu uh, inquisitors. It was not seen in everywhere in Europe, so it was really primarily where the pope would send inquisitors to certain areas. It was not everywhere. And it was primarily to investigate heresy. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. But primarily for heresy, the jurisdiction was only baptized Christians. And at that time, that would be equal to saying baptized Catholics. You had to be baptized or you fell out of the jurisdiction of the Inquisitions, with very few exceptions. So the idea that the Inquisitions went around and just killing Jews, same with the Spanish Inquisition, as you'll find out in a minute, it's untrue. You had to be a baptized Christian to fall under the jurisdiction of the Inquisitions because they, that was really only, that was the Pope's primary charge. Are the baptized Christians committing heresy or as you'll see it also will address some other irregular behaviors but are they committing heresy? When we're looking at the Inquisitions oftentimes historians will divide these up into three periods this is not all-encompassing. This actually doesn't include all of them that happened, but it's just an easy, convenient way to kind of break these down and look, and look at different periods of time. And they're broken down into, th into these three groups based on common characteristics and a common focus. But again, it doesn't include all of them. There are some in Venice and Portugal, plus the secular kingdoms all have, have these going on. The Protestant countries will have theirs. So there's more than just these three groups. But this makes it easy when you're just trying to break it down and, and make it make a little sense. The inquisitions that we're going to talk about really take place over a period of about 600 years. And we're going to talk about these three groups, the medieval inquisitions, the Spanish inquisition, and then the Roman inquisition. And then the first period we're going to talk about are the medieval inquisitions. This period of time is from 1184 to about the 1300s when it starts to fade out. And the background with this is it's a response to the rise of heresy. So if you remember in the 10th, 11th centuries, you start to see the rise in heresy and dissent. The church first tries the Episcopal visitation, but it really doesn't work. So her next step is the Inquisitions. And so this is to address a variety of heresies that are rising up in Europe. The biggest threat were, was the first group, the Cathars, are also called the Albigensians. They were rapidly spreading in some parts of Europe, and they were disruptive not only because of their beliefs, but also because they were committing a lot of violent acts against Christians. And so with all these different heresies, the church uh, makes a plan to address them. The Pope was very concerned, as were the bishops, that the communities were having these lynch mobs because they were rising up everywhere with people taking justice into their own hands. The secular rulers were also going out and finding heretics and charging them and senten sentencing many of them to the death penalty. And over time that happens more and more. And the Pope was concerned that there may be people who are being innocently charged and, and found guilty. The lynch mobs definitely may be killing innocent people. And the church also was concerned because are these people being given a chance to receive instruction in the faith and being given a chance to reconcile? 
the secular penalties for some, for, in some places for heretics was either having their tongues be torn out, um, and then more often it was becoming the death penalty, as I mentioned. So the Pope is really concerned about this, and so the Pope's going to respond. The first thing the Pope is going to do is denounce the heretics. The, po ch the Church is also going to say, you know, I don't recommend the death penalty and I don't recommend the lynch mobs because I don't want innocent, being, innocent people being killed and we've got to make sure they're receiving proper instruction because if they're not being given proper instruction, we need to make sure we're saving souls. It's not just about punishment or revenge. We need to make sure we save souls. So the first thing that the Pope did um, was to send out people to go and catechize and evangelize the areas where the heresies were rising up. The Pope issued a decree that heretics could be punished with excommunication. If you were a cleric, you could be disposed. If you were a monk, you could be expelled. If you were a public official, you could be removed from office. And then he emphasized the goal is saving souls. So. And now most of the, there's a lot of evidence that says these first steps taken by the church did have a lot of success. There were substantial numbers of people who did reconcile with the church by these efforts of evangelization, catechesis, instruction, that they were effective. But despite the success, the heresies persisted. And so the church needed to do something more. So in 1184, Pope Lucius decrees what is called the founding charter of the medieval inquisitions. And he commanded, his first step is to command every bishop to visit every, every parish where heresy is reported twice a year. And then he would find those people who were accused, and then the bishop or appointed officials would be the inquisitors. And they would, they would look at the evidence, see if there was enough evidence to bring them to trial. If there was, then the bishop would be the presider at trial. And this was the first stage of the medieval inquisitions, and it was called the Episcopal, the Episcopal period. So you had Episcopal oversight. The bishops would be the primary ones overseeing what was happening in the inquisitions. And the Pope, whenever he made this decree, he also said that heretics are to face ecclesial judgment. And so the, the bishops, they were given that power to hear the trials and make the sentences for those found guilty. And the Pope also said that if a heretic persists in his heresy, then as a last resort we will hand him over to the state. And so this was the first part of the medieval inquisitions, was the Episcopal period. And these Episcopal inquisitions were effective to a degree, but the heresies persisted. And in many ways the heretics were coming, becoming more elusive, more rebellious. The lynch mobs were still occurring. The secular penalties were becoming more and more severe for all crimes, including heresy. And the Pope was also concerned because the Episcopal procedures and the penalties were not uniform. There was vi there's inconsistencies depending on what location these were taking place. And the Pope also wanted to ensure that every step was being taken to ensure innocent people were being found guilty. Even, even people who were the most skilled and most successful at um, talking to witnesses and hearing testimony could still be fooled by false testimony. And there were people who were trying to abuse this system to bring their enemies or people they hated forward and make ac false accusations. And so even the most skilled um, bishops, and as we see as the Inquisition goes on, over time even the most skilled inquisitors could be fooled by false testimony. So the Pope wanted to make sure every measure was being taken to protect innocent people from being handed over. And so because the Episcopal visit the Episcopal Inquisitions were helpful and effective to some degree, but not as much, as much as he wanted. Over time, the Pope is going to introduce a new plan. And this happens with Pope Gregory IX in 1231. And he's going to appoint the mendicant orders to have oversight of the Inqui Inquisitions at this point. Now particularly, this will be the Dominicans and the Franciscans. And he's going to have them be the Inquisitors. And they're going to supplement the role of the bishops and their goal was to root out heretics and their primary goal was to educate them and help to bring them back to the church. Reconciliation was the goal. The mendicant orders and particularly the Dominicans and Franciscans were chosen because they had strengths in the area of education and evangelization. They were also well known for the holiness. People w respected them everywhere and so they were well respected and that was another reason they were chosen. They were also very loyal to the Pope and plus they were monks. They were very mobile. They could go wherever the Pope needed them to go. 
And so the mendicant orders would assist the local bishops and they would be the inquisitors. And the Pope told the orders, ensure that everywhere you go, the salvation of souls is to always be stressed. That's first and foremost, the salvation of souls. And so this begins to happen. The mendicant orders are sent to the different locations where heresies are prevalent, and they are the inquisitors. The initial several decades of the inquisitions were a little bit inconsistent, as I mentioned, and so once the mendicant orders take this role, they're going to start to bring uniformity and consistency to the inquisitions. And by 1242, they're going to have developed really a clear code of procedures, and there's going to be a lot of things that are, that are produced in different manuals that all have a pretty clear process, pretty clear step of procedures. The penances will be a lot more consistent. There'll be instructions on how to perform the procedures, how to give the penances, so it becomes a lot more uniform um, throughout the uh, different locations during the, this period of the medieval inquisitions. Now we need to start to look at the procedures at this point. So what were the procedures? What, were, what happened during the inquisitions? Were there, were there public trials and public torture? Were people burned at the stake? Were there horrific dun dungeons? And so let's take a look. So the procedures for the medieval inquisitions. What would happen would be number one, the inquisitor would be assigned to a particular location. He would go to that location and his first act was a sermon and preaching to really emphasize that our first step is to reconcile, to bring back these, these heretics to the church. And so these sermons would be that he would teach on orthodoxy as well as preach against the heresy. And so it's a very important component of education for him doing this. The next step is that he would call forward the heretics and say, I want you to come forward if you're a heretic. Or if you know heretics, I want you to bring their names to me. And he would issue what's called the Edict of Grace. And this was a grace period. It could be two weeks to several months. And if the heretics came forward voluntarily and recanted and repented, and then reconcile with the church, they would only be given a very light penance and have no other consequences. And so this light penance may be wearing a yellow cross on their garments or fasting. Just a fairly light penance and no other consequences if they came forward during this grace period. Following this grace period though, if the inquisitor had been given names or accusations, he would investigate the evidence, talk to witnesses, gather as much information as he possibly could. He would also have the accused write a list of names of their enemies. And if any of those enemies appeared on a list of witnesses, those witnesses could not testify. They wanted to try to prevent abuse and using this system as, as a means for revenge. It wasn't always successful, but they tried to do different measures to try to decrease the abuse. If there was enough evidence, then the inquisitor would formally charge the person in writing and they would go to trial or a tribunal. The accused person was given many opportunities to recant and, and confess throughout this whole process. They continued to encourage them to reconcile with the church. But in the trials, so you would have many people present to, to witness, in, including the inquisitor, sometimes more than one. And then in the trial, they would present the evidence, the testimony, and everything they had. Everything was recorded in detail, and so you still have mass files and documentation from these events. The goal really was to get the person to confess and reconcile. That was really the, out, the hope, the outcome they hoped for was reconciliation with the church. If outside of the grace period they repent, then they would be reconciled with the church, but they would also receive penances. They would often be more severe, um, but it could be various things. It could still be wearing a cross in the garment, fasting. It could be a pilgrimage. Um, it could be a period of imprisonment. Their goods would also be confiscated, their property. This was not something the church decreed. This was part of state law. State law was that a guilty heretic had his goods, his possessions confiscated. And so if they confessed outside of the grace period, they would be held to this consequence. If there was no confession and they did not repent, then the inquisitor had to look at proof. Partial proof and full proof were the two types of proof that, it, that they would look at. Full proof was considered two eyewitnesses being caught in the act or a confession. Everything else outside of this was partial proof. 
you had to have at least one full proof in a capital crime. So to sentence someone to the death penalty, you had to have full proof. If there is full proof available and the person refuses to repent, they'll be handed over to the state. So they'll be given, oftentimes they'll be given some type of canonical punishment, but also handed over to the state. Now the difficulty comes is if there is no full proof and you don't have a confession, they, let's say you have abundant partial proofs. You have many, many partial proofs that are suggesting this person is guilty, but you do not have full proof. What would they do? They have to have a confession in order to be able to convict this person in a capital crime. So to obtain a confession, they would use intense interrogation, pleas from family members, and then if all this was ineffective and there was no way they could get full proof in any other way, they might have to resort to torture. Now I'm going to briefly present some facts about torture in the Inquisition, and I'm not trying to justify it in any way. I'm just going to present some of the details about torture. Now torture, unlike what we use today in our modern ideas, that torture is for punishment. But at that period of time, torture wasn't punishment. It was part of the judicial proceedings. It was an element of this process in order to obtain a confession. It was only used if absolutely needed. And, and this, again, not to justify it, but the church did have very strict protocols whenever she um, had torture used in, the, in these inquisitions. And her restrictions were much more strict than secular courts. And then with torture, if confession was given under torture, then that had the confession had to be freely repeated the next day outside of torture or it was invalid. And again, one of the things to emphasize, and again, it doesn't justify it, but the church was using things that were in accord with common customs at the time. All secular courts, all the inquisitorial procedure, procedures were using torture if necessary. So the restrictions that the church placed on torture, it could only be applied once and for a limited period of time. And a lot of historians say often that was 15 minutes. Usually it wasn't more than that. But definitely it was once and for a restricted period of time. The torture could never be so severe that it risked loss of limb or loss of life. There were witnesses that recorded all the details and a doctor had to be present. The other thing about torture is what they would also do is they would present all the instruments of torture to the accused and give them one more chance to confess before the torture would take place. Now, unfortunately, torture was used during the Inquisitions. Now, the historians do tell us that it was rarely used, but it was still used. Some historians say 95% of the time they never had to use it. I've seen other historians say 98% of the time they never had to use it. But there was a small percent of times that the church did resort to torture to try to obtain a confession. Now, what methods were used? The, the two pictures here depicting one popular um, method, and this was called strapado. And strapado would be when the person's hands were tied behind their back with a rope, and then the rope was thrown over a beam in the ceiling, and then the person would be um, lifted up, hauled up into the air, held there for a minute, then released, then held up again, then released. Sometimes they would even tie weights to their feet to make it more painful. And so really the goal is pain. They, they had to do everything they could to avoid dislocation and um, they could not risk loss of limb. And so it was mainly just to, for severe pain, to try to inflict intense pain. But that's strapado. The, the picture on your left is another example of strapado, another depiction. On the right, sometimes you could also see them applying fire to the soles of their feet. Again, just to inflict severe pain. Now strapado, most of the historians say the strapado was probably the most common that was used. Um, but the fire to the soles of the feet was a possibility. You also hear people talking about like stretching, stretching on the rack. This wasn't as common, but it was something that, that was known at that time as a form of torture. And then there are various other methods, but these are probably the three that are most commonly talked about. Now, who were the inquisitors? We often hear a lot of myths about the inquisitors and how horrible they were. The, the goal of the inquisitors, and you can see this even in their writings, they recognized their goal was to save souls and protect the unity of the church. 
the inquisitors were faced with some difficulty because the people, the lay people, often just wanted the, to be rid of the heretic as soon as possible because they wanted to protect their community from corruption, but they also didn't want the wrath of God coming on them. And so they, would, they just wanted the heretic destroyed and, and gotten rid of. He, they wanted him, uh, their society rid of him as soon as possible. And then the secular officers, they just wanted to punish them, the heretics as soon as possible as well. So the inquisitors were both pastors and jurists because they definitely had salvation of souls, number one. If you read a lot of the um, inquisitors' writings, they'll talk about they viewed their mission as a success if there was reconciliation. If the heretic was imprisoned or killed, they saw that their mission was a failure. And so they really saw the salvation of souls, number one. The personalities of the inquisitors did vary, and so sometimes you would have some that were more ruthless and some that were more sympathetic. But most commonly, the criteria were most of the time they needed to be 40 years old, have a master's of theology, have good morals and insight, and be of high respectability. Now there were some who were more tyrannical, and these were a public menace when they held office, but people would complain immediately of these, and as soon as they were discovered, they were disposed of. The historians say that the majority of the inquisitors acted with the highest moral caliber and they, most of the time, they had a genuine zeal for souls. They really saw their mission as trying to save souls. If the inquisitor wasn't a lawyer, they were generally assisted by some. And then historian Edward Peters, I'm just going to read something that he wrote about the inquisitors. He said that overall, they all, they all largely displayed remarkable understanding of the people they interrogated, both in the medieval inquisitions as well as, in all, as well as in all of the others. They understood very well that the lack of catechesis and lack of consistent pastoral guidance could often result in misunderstandings of doctrine and liturgy, and they showed much pace, patience and tolerance with them. And so the majority of them really were performing their duties very well. Now the jurisdiction of the inquisitors, as I've already referred to earlier, was the baptized Christians. Out, anyone not baptized was really outside of their jurisdiction, with very few exceptions. Now they primarily were looking at those accused of heresy, and this was their primary duty. However, at times they would have a secondary duty, and that would be looking at people who are living contrary to church teachings. And so this would especially occur as the heresies start to fade out, because the inquisitions do start to be effective, and so as the heresies are fading out, this will become one of their bigger priorities. And so they may investigate people who are accused of fornication or adultery or refusal to attend the sacraments or other things, things that the baptized Christians should be doing if they're living their faith. And so the irregularities in behavior would become a secondary focus at times. But it was always baptized Christians that was their, their, their jurisdiction. There also were manuals that developed to ensure fairness and uniformity. These would have detailed rules, procedures, guidelines, training. It would give them tips on how to perform their duty. And so it would give them tips on how they can distinguish genuine and insincere repentance, how they can try to guard against accusations made based on envy and hostility, give them tips on how to always keep the door open to forgiveness. It would also give them descriptions of how to apply sen sentencing as well. So the manuals became very helpful. Now one of the most common myths about the inquisitors is that they were feared, they were zealous, fanatical, tyrannical, they were responsible for millions being executed. And this is all completely false. Now one, this picture here on the right is actually an actor who plays in a movie called In the Name of the Rose starring Sean Connery. And so this man is depicting one of the inquis inquisitors by the name of Bernard Guy. And Bernard Guy was reportedly this evil, fanatical, zealous man who aroused fear everywhere he went. And so the movie does depict him in that fashion. But the reality is that Bernard Guy was not like that. He was assigned to be an inquisitor for 16 years. He was a Dominican monk. He wrote one of the most popular procedural man manuals during that time. And in documentation, it's evident that he is very reticent to see people executed. And he felt that if it was the ultimate result that someone was executed, he had completely failed in his mission. 
and he really tried to reserve that sentence only for the most vile and unrepentant heretics. He would only hand them over to the state as a last resort. And the numbers show us that he sentenced about 930 people during his 16 years. 42 went on to be handed over to the state for execution. 307 were imprisoned. Now oftentimes during this medieval inquisitions, imprisonment could often be given for life, but m most often this was ultimately co commuted, and so their sentences were usually shorter than that. Um, but oftentimes they'd be sentenced to a life sentence, but then it'd be shortened over time. And before I move on to the prisons, during the medieval inquisitions there were two types of prisons. One version was life kind of like in a monastery. There was some freedom for movement, but not a lot. And then another version was a single cell, where it was fairly cramped, you didn't have a lot of room to move. But those are usually the two options. And then in, in prison you'd be given a minimal diet, you could have no visitors but your spouse. And so life was difficult, um, but it was prison. Now the prisons were not like what we have today, they didn't have the capacity to imprison everyone. But um, imprisonment was a common sentence, so as you can see it was his most common, uh, what, the mo it was the second most common thing. And so then 139 were acquitted and everyone else received penances. And so most of his people either received penances or imprisonment. And as you can see, 4.5% were handed over to the state. So it's nothing like what you hear with him being responsible for thousands or millions being executed. There's other estimates that we have from some of the other inquisitors. For the Diocese of Turin for all of 14th century, there were 22 executed, 41 given the penance of wearing a cross, and 150 received other pe versions of penance. Another inquisitor who is fairly famous was Jacques Fournier, who tried 114 cases with five being executed and all the others being given penances. The historians estimate that during the medieval inquisitions, approximately 2,000 people were handed over to the state for execution. And so it's really different than the millions that you hear about. So about 2,000. And so the church would say even one person we're not, we're not proud of, and especially some of them may have been innocent. We don't know. It's definitely possible. And so definitely there are, there are there's some regrettable things with the death sentences being given out and the torture, but um, it's definitely not to the mythical proportions we often hear. Over time, the medieval inquisitions do fade because they're effective. The heresies start to fade out. So by the 1300s, you really don't see them around anymore. So then that leads us to the next period of time, which is the Spanish Inquisition. This one's probably the most well-known and the most criticized. And it was from the period of 1478 to 1834. Now we do have to start to establish a little bit of background first. Prior to the 15th century, so prior to the 1400s, Spain was a Catholic country and it was very unique in Europe. It was very diverse religiously. Muslims, Christians, and Jews all lived side by side in peace. This was very unique and different than the rest of Europe. But in Spain, if you remember, there were hun for hundreds of years there's wars in Spain between the Catholics and the Muslims especially. And so the boundaries, the borders are constantly changing, constantly shifting for hundreds of years. So the people have to learn to live together. And so it's very diverse, but it's peaceful. The rest of Europe isn't, isn't as religiously diverse, and there actually are some problems. The 11th, 12th, 13th centuries, you start to see a rise of anti-Semitism throughout Europe. This ultimately leads, to, is one of the reasons you see the Jews expelled from England in 1290, and the Jews are also expelled from France in 1306. So there's a lot of anti-Semitism, unfortunately, throughout Europe at this time. But Spain really holds it off because of their years of having diversity and their years of the different religions living side by side, they hold it off for a while. But unfortunately, in the 14th century, it's probably inevitable, but the waves of anti-Semitism do enter into Spain. And what you're going to see is as a result, urban mobs rise up, riots rise up, and the Jews are severely persecuted in Spain. It basically forces them to either flee to the countryside or convert to the Christian faith. Many of them do convert out of societal pressure. They're pressured just from the persecutions to convert. So there are the conversions of Jews and some of them are pressured um, just by society. 
And then what will start to happen is these Jews who now convert live side by side with their family and friends who they had known. And so the, the Jewish converts now live near Jews and they start to influence them. So at first the larger numbers of Jews that converted were probably forced. But then over the next several decades the influence of their friends and family who had converted who now are starting to live the Catholic faith very faithfully and, and piously start to influence Jews and many, you start to see many voluntary conversions of the Jews start taking place. There's also accounts in the 1400s where there's some debates between Christians and Jews just talking about the different faiths um, cordial and amicable debates that happen and as a result many other Jews voluntarily convert. So you start to see some Jews being converted because of societal pressures but other Jews are converting voluntarily. So you see a rise in the conversion of the Jews in Spain to the Christian faith. They're, they come to be given the name conversos and really this is unfortunate but it's, it's given to them by the the old Catholics. The old Catholics want to distinguish themselves from these new converts. So the new Jewish converts are called conversos. With these, this rise in this conversos population, the anti-Semitism still hasn't left Spain. So the, there's still anti-Semitism where the Jews are being persecuted. But what you start to see is this animosity is not overcome. It is now extended to the conversos. A lot of the animosity for the Jewish people is now extended to these Jewish converts and they start to be persecuted. And there's also some conspiracy theories that start to rise up. Many of the people start to say there are so many Jews who converted insincerely with the goal of infiltrating the monarchy and infiltrating the church. They want to destroy it. So you have these conspiracy theories starting to rise up and they gain ground. Now the historians believe that there may be some converts who were insincere and did have impure motives. But they say that the numbers that were talked about at the time were completely exaggerated. That these really were conspiracy theories. But they spread and they took ground. It got to the point where the king and queen, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, started to hear these accusations and wonder if these were real. Now the historians tell us that these Jewish converts were very faithful and very pious, so these conspiracy theories were false, but the king and queen hear them and they become very concerned and over time they just continue to hear more and more and more of these theories to the point they wonder, is this true? Are they trying to infiltrate the kingdom and the church and destroy us? So the king, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella send a letter to the Pope and they request him to approve an inquisition to investigate the matter. So they want the Pope to approve an inquisition. Pope Sixtus IV at the time in 1478 will send uh, approval. He will approve the king and queen to appoint two or three priests to lead an inquisition to investigate this matter. The king didn't think anything would really come up from this, but he was wrong. People came out of the woodworks to denounce the conversos. There was a lot of score settling, resentment, and hatred, and so accusations were coming left and right. Everywhere they looked, there were more and more accusations. Let me see. There was also a great deal, of, great deal of hysteria and confusion. It was just madness at this point. Once they announced the Inquisition would take place, conversos were, everyone was accusing all these different conversos of being traitors basically to the faith. Now during this time most of the conversos were acquitted but not all. There were some who were found guilty and historians do report that unfortunately some if not many probably were found guilty based on false testimony. Now at this point though we have to there's a little bit of a distinction. The Pope did approve the King and Queen to have an inquisition but the Pope did not oversee it. It was overseen by the King and the Queen. Whenever the Pope starts to hear that there's some people who are being found guilty and being given the death penalty even, the Pope becomes concerned because he's hearing that there's a lot of false testimony, there's a lot of accusations based on hatred. So the Pope even writes a letter to the King and he tells them, I'm very concerned that this system is being abused and that a lot of people are using this as a form of vengeance. And the Pope wanted the local bishops to have more of a role in overseeing the tribunals that were happening to really try to make sure that innocent people weren't being found guilty and to also make sure these people were given education and instruction before they were found guilty. 
Now the crown rejected this. The crown said, "No, we don't want your help." The the king knew better for the the, the king knew better than the pope what was good for Spain, and so the pope, king was like, "I don't want your help," basically. Now again, the jurisdiction for this inquisition were baptized Christians. It was not Jewish people. It was Jewish converts who had been baptized and came into the faith. Um, but sometimes you hear a lot of myths that the Spanish Inquisition was executing and torturing thousands or millions of Jews. But it was people who had converted who were Jewish. So they had to be baptized. And again, it was primarily the conversos init initially. It'll change a little bit later. The oversight was the king and the queen. They had oversight. They had papal permission to appoint some of the, king, the priests to be inquisitors, but the pope was not going to oversee this. When the pope tried to intervene, his interventions were rejected and the, and the king refused to allow the local bishops to be involved. And so what we're going to see at these, these inquisitorial tribunals in Spain are really separate from the ecclesial authority. And that they are going to model them after the medieval inquisitions. Um, we're going to talk more about that here in just a second. But what we start seeing as well is there are more and more accusations that just continue to come forth. The initial two inquisitors they had appointed are just overwhelmed. And so the king will appoint seven more. So now you have nine inquisitors for the country of Spain. The accusations continue to come in. Another major concern that the Pope and the bishops had is that the procedures at the beginning of this process were straying from church standards. They weren't living up to the standards of the medieval inquisition that had been established. There were also many, too many that were being found guilty without any instruction. And so the Pope and the bishops continue to try to intervene and say, we need, we need to have more oversight, more involvement to make sure this is being done fair and consistent, but the, Pope, the king continues to refuse and not listen. The volume of accusations continues to increase so much that the king and queen start to think, wow, this problem of these secret Jews must be real. There, they, there must be really tons of these Jews who have converted and are insincere. And because of all the confusion and the concerns that it's the Jewish people who are influencing these conversos, the king and queen in 1492, so about 14 years after the Inquisition started, they expel all the Jews and Muslims from Spain and they say, you either leave or you convert. Now, the historians say it does appear their motives were religious, but whatever their motivation, the result was twofold. One, many did leave. Many did leave Spain. But unfortunately, the second result is you had a large number who did stay and convert. So now this population of secret Jews is even bigger. So now you have all these new, new Jews who have now converted, and people still have this animosity, so even more accusations come forward, unfortunately. This is a little slippery slope. During the first 25 years of the Spanish Inquisition, it was the deadliest. And we'll talk about what that, what that means. But there was a lot of hysteria, a lot of confusion, a lot of abuse. There wasn't a lot of un uniformity and consistency. The procedures they were using were not inconsistent with church standards. They were modeling, after, modeling it after the medieval inquisitions, but really were not holding up the highest standards possible. Um, but what we start to see, fortunately, is after about the first 25 years, there, there are some new inquisitors that come in and they start to reform it. And they really work hard to make this more consistent with how the medieval inquisitions had been run. And after the first 25 years or so, from that point on, the Spanish Inquisition had few critics. So for the next 375 years, it really did not have many critics. It was staffed by well-educated legal professionals. It was considered one of the most efficient and compassionate judicial courts in Europe. And no major court in Europe executed fewer people than the Spanish Inquisition as a whole, but especially in, this, in the last 375 years of it. So they do reform it, and it does become better and improved. But those first 25 years were just very chaotic, a lot of hysteria and confusion. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the procedures because once the reforms happen, they do become very similar to the medieval inquisitions with just a few exceptions. And so just as we mentioned, so the inquisitor would be appointed to a location. He would arrive, give his sermon, do the preaching, give the instruction. He would call the heretics to come forward. He would issue an edict of grace, a grace period, two weeks to a few months, to come forward. And if you come forward, you'll have a light penance and no other consequences.
And then if they didn't come forward, you would have the inquisitor investigate the charges, talk to the witnesses, just like we heard before. If there's enough evidence, they would go to trial. There'd be many people present to witness the trial. It'd be recorded in detail. And then the evidence was presented, and the hope was that you would have some form of foolproof, um, particularly a confession. And during the trial, the accused person was put in prison. We'll talk about the prisons in a minute. Similar to the medieval inquisitions, if they repented outside of the grace period, they'd be reconciled, receive penance, have their goods confiscated, and then they'd be reconciled to the church. You did need full proof. And so if you have full proof, they refuse to repent, then they'd be given some type of sentence, often was the death penalty. And since this was oversighted by the, the government itself, they could issue the death penalty. If you had no full proof, but a lot of other evidence, as we mentioned before, just as with the medieval inquisitions, torture could be used in this one as well. Again, it was an element of the process to obtain a confession used as a last resort. Just as with the medieval inquisitions, the historians say it was very infrequently needed. Probably same percentage as the medieval inquisitions, more than 95% 95 of the cases probably did not use torture. And it was definitely, torture was definitely used far less frequently than any other secular courts of the time. Not to justify it, but it's just to point out some of the realities of that period of time. Now one thing that was unique to the Spanish Inquisition was a, a public ceremony that was called the auto de fe. It was very unique to the Spanish Inquisition. But what they would do is after the trial, they would have a procession of the accused people. They would associate it with a mass, and they would have public prayers, the sermon, and other, other public, public things would be involved in this ceremony, but definitely it was associated with a mass. And the purpose was to emphasize that their goal was reconciliation with the church. That was really the goal for what was happening here. After mass, the public, there'd be a public reading of the sentences of the accused, and it could vary. It could be dismissal, acquittal, reconciliation with a penance, or they would sentence some people found guilty. Now, one of the myths about this is that there are crowds of people who had watched this procession, and at the end, people would be burned at the stake. But that's not what happened. There was no public torture. There were no public executions during this ceremony. A lot of the art will depict that, but it's false. If punishment was given, it was done separate from this pu public ceremony. And so this is a depiction of a procession of the accused. This is another depiction in art where you see all the people ra crowding around watching being, people being burned at the stake, but this is a mythical depiction. You would not have these public ceremonies with the procession, with the result being people standing around watching as people were burned at the stake. So public, the, the public ceremony, the auto de fe, was separate from the punishment phase. Now what about the dungeons and the prisons in the Spanish Inquisition? Were they torture chambers? Well, the Spanish Inquisition had jails, and as I mentioned, they would often, the accused would stay in prison during trial. And then some of the guilty were given life imprisonments. And just as with the medieval Inquisitions, oftentimes these were commuted, given as life, but then shortened later on. But the prisons were neither dark nor dungeon-like. And really, as far as prisons go, the ones in the Spanish Inquisition were the best prisons in Europe. There's even cases where a criminal in Spain who was found guilty in the criminal court, the civil court, would blaspheme intentionally so he could be sent to the Inquis Inquisition court because he'd rather be in their prison. And so there's, ca there's cases like that. So the Spanish Inquisition did not have horrific prisons. Um, they weren't, I mean, there still were prisons, but they weren't the worst in the world. They weren't dungeons. They weren't torture chambers, as some people claim. So in the Spanish Inquisition, what was the death toll? Well, there is something that's called the Black Legend that was created about the Spanish Inquisition. And it says anywhere from 50 to 95 million people were executed during the Spanish Inquisition. You can see this even being promoted today. There's even books being written that still say this number. But this is completely false. The Black Legend was created around 1567 almost 100 years after the Spanish Inquisition began. 
And at this time, what was happening in 1567, where the Protestant countries were at war, particularly with the Catholic countries, including Spain. And in the 1500s, Spain was the wealthiest and most powerful government. And so you have Protestant countries like England and Germany and the Netherlands fighting the Catholic countries like Spain, and they were losing. In, mili in the military battles, they were losing. The Protestant countries were losing because Spain was a great military might. They really were difficult to be defeated. So knowing that they really didn't stand a chance on the battlefield, the Protestant countries actually get a new weapon. And it's called the printing press. And what they do is they create a variety of propaganda, pamphlets and papers and books, and they start to create many things, many stories. One of them is the Black Legend. And they distribute it, distribute it everywhere. The Black Legend basically stated that the Spaniards were ruthless and barbaric and backwards, and that they were executing and torturing millions of people. Spain was shown to be a place of evil, and the hope was that popular opinion would turn against Spain. And even though this propaganda was false, it was very effective. It worked. And that's how come we can even still see these stories being promoted today. It worked. People believed it and bought into it, and they're still promoting it even today. So the black legend states 50 to 95 million were executed. But in reality, historians say that over the 350 years of the Spanish Inquisition, 4,000 total were executed. 2,000 in that first 25 years, so it was the deadliest. It was, there was chaos, hysteria. About 2,000 were killed during that 25, first 25 years. And then the remaining, it should be 75, 375 years. Or no, 325, I'm right, my math. So 325 years, 2,000 were executed. So 4,000 total during that 350 year period. Now to give you a sense for what that number means, we can compare to some other things that happened around that same time period. So during, this, during a similar time frame in Europe, there were what you may hear about are the witch trials that were going on, primarily in, in the Protestant countries. They really didn't get, in, get into the Catholic countries for many reasons. One of the reasons were the Inquisitions really kept these out. But the witch trials over about 300 years executed about 35,000 people. There's different sources, say different numbers, um, but about 35,000. The reign of terror during the French Revolution in 1793 in one year executed about 40,000 people. Some people say 15,000, some people say 50,000, but still far more than what happened during the 350 years of the Spanish Inquisition. And then finally, King Henry VIII in Protestant England during the 1500s, when he was king during 28 years, he had at least 10,000 people executed. And a lot of people say you could, it was five times that number. Some people say as high as 70,000 that he had killed. And so we can kind of compare the numbers, again, not to justify it, but 4,000 during a 350 year period compared to some of these other things that were occurring during the, about this same time. Now again, just to summarize for the Spanish Inquisition, the oversight was the monarchy. From 1478 to 1530, the first portion of it, the primary focus was the conversos, those Jewish people who had converted, and they were concerned they had converted insincerely. Then in 1530 to 1650, the focus becomes on Protestantism, as well as humanism and other irregularities that, the, that were happening in the people's lives. Protestantism starts to rise at this point, and Spain does not want it entering into its country. And so as soon as different accusations are made about these ideas being held, the Inquisition, the Inquisitors would go and investigate. And they actually were very successful in stopping Protestantism from entering Spain. And again, the jurisdiction was still baptized Christians. It, wasn't, it didn't involve people who weren't baptized, um, but it did um, charge and, and prosecute people who were having Protestant, Protestant ideas and Protestant faith. They really didn't execute very many in this period, but definitely they stopped the spread of Protestantism into Spain, so it was effective. And then the last portion, it goes back again, focusing on the conversos, and then it begins to fade over time, becomes less and less active, and then in 1834 it was finally abolished. Now the Spanish people um, will tell you that they saw the Spanish Inquisition as preserving the purity of their faith. And actually when it was abolished, people rioted in the streets. They were upset. They wanted to see it stay because they found it to be very effective and very beneficial. But it, did, it was formally abolished in 1834.
Now the last phase we're going to talk about is the Roman Inquisition. And this one we're not going to spend a lot of time on. It's probably the least, it was, ve it was very inactive, um, not, not very well known. But the Roman Inquisition uh, occurred. And the background for this is in 1517, if you remember, pro uh, Luther begins his protest with the church. And in 1570, the first several years, he wasn't, very, he wasn't noticed by the popes. But over time, Luther and the Protestant ideas that were spreading did gain the attention from the papacy and from the bishops. And in the in 1530s, 1540s, people start, started calling for reform and preaching to try to educate people. They were battling this heresy. In 1542, in response to the Protestant, ide Protestant ideas that were spreading, Paul III called for the Roman Inquisition and established it. He named six cardinal inquisitors. And one of these inquisitors would actually become the Pope, Paul, Pope Paul IV in 1555. But then in 1588... Sixtus V established this as a holy office in the Curia called the Congregation of the Holy Roman and Universal Inquisition. The chief target was Protestantism, baptized Christians and then the, who were holding this, these heretical views of Protestantism. They would investigate other charges as well, other irregularities of behavior, but it was primarily Protestantism. The jurisdiction was really only the papal states and parts of Italy because that's wh where the papal oversight was. So the Roman Inquisition was localized to this area. And the procedures were very similar to the medieval Inquisition, so I'm not going to get into those, but they're very similar to that. This Inquisition did have some influence for about 200 years. It really did help to limit the spread of Protestantism into this region. It also helped to prevent the spread of, of the hysteria about the witchcraft and sorcery. It really limited, limited the spread of that into this area as well. <coughs> this really had no power or influence after the 18th century, as the 18th century goes on, because what's going to happen is Napoleon will come and under the French government um, will take over this area and then this office will be abolished for a short time. Then in 1814 it's restored. And then it just really doesn't have a lot of influence as an inquisition, so it really became more of an advisory committee for the Pope. In 1908, Pius X changed the name to the Congregation of the Holy Office. Again, it was more of an advisory committee. Then in 1965, Paul VI changed the name to the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And again, it was an advisory committee to the Pope on theological matters and matters of ecclesiastical discipline. And this is, the con this is the Holy Office still present today in the Curia, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, and Cardinal Ratzinger was head of that before he became Pope. But this, the duty of this, they don't really associate it with the term Inquisition anymore, but it still has a similar function. It really is to safeguard and promote the doctrines on faith and morals, to protect the doctrines from any kind of heretical ideas or heretical opinions entering in. And when you look on the Vatican website to really see its duty, it says to promote and safeguard the doctrine on faith and morals, to foster studies so that understanding of the faith may grow, to carefully examine writings and opinions that seem contrary or dangerous to the faith, and it takes great care to prevent, permit errors or dangerous doctrines from spreading among the faith. And so it has a similar role, it's just no longer really associated with the term inquisition. And we don't have the same procedures at this point. And so that's the Roman Inquisition. Not very well known, but still, has, still plays an important role in the church. So the final points to really emphasize in these last few minutes. The Inquisition really should be referred to in the plural, as there never was one. It was not invented by the church. It was a legal procedure that was revised from things that had been developed under the Roman Empire. And it also occurred in secular courts at the time, in the Middle Ages. It wasn't just procedure, legal procedures the church was using. The governments in the Middle Ages were also using it. The Spanish Inquisition was primarily a secular institution. Many people equate it with the church and the papacy, but the monarchy had oversight of it. Jurisdiction of the Inquisitions were baptized Christians, and that's very important because there are many, many myths that they executed and tortured millions of Jews, or many of, many of the, if they, ex if they 
took Protestants under their investigation, they, were, they had to be baptized. So it wouldn't have been people who were not baptized Christians. So the Jews definitely were not um, persecuted to any large degree. Torture was used, but it was considered an element of the legal proceedings custom to the time. And it is regrettable, though it was rarely used in the church's inquisitions, and even in the Spanish inquisitions it was rarely used. And the death penalty was the result of some of the trials, unfortunately, but overall it really was about less than 2% of the cases. Whenever we're looking, about, looking at events and actions in the, in, in the past, in history, we have to distinguish the principles and the methods used to defend those principles. And so really the principle of trying to root out heresy is scriptural. Heresy truly is a danger to our soul. And it's necessary that we recognize it, acknowledge it, and address it. So that principle is something we should praise those people in the Middle Ages for, that principle of addressing heresy. But the means used to live out those principles was sometimes regrettable. And so we do acknowledge that. When we're looking at the past, we also have to determine fact and fiction. So I've shown a lot of different myths that are promoted. And so it's very important that we determine fact and fiction when we, look, when we talk about things in the past. We also have to be very careful that when we're evaluating the past, we look at all the context, the causes, the effects, um, everything that was taking place. And then we have to apply the standards of the past era to our evaluation and apply our own standards of today with great care. We also need to look and see how do the contemporaries view these things that were going on. That will help give us a better sense of evaluating what happened. And as I mentioned, those who recognized the purpose of the Inquisition protested when some of these things were abolished. So the Spanish Inquisition, the Span Span Spaniard people protested. They really found the Inquisition to be helpful and, and, a, and good for fighting heresy. So even though there were some regrettable methods used, the principles can be upheld even today. We also have to keep in mind the mindset of this time period. As I referred to earlier, the mindset of the Middle Ages was theocentric. Today, it's more about my own private truth and relativism and individualism. God is either denied or pushed off to the periphery. But in the Middle Ages, God was the center of their life. Everything had an orderly arrangement and the summit was God. The center of life was God. To attack the faith of Christ's church, was attacking the foundations of society. Heresy was seen as being more dangerous than a contagious plague. The spiritual life was what was attacked with heresy. And so they felt everything needed to be done to stop heresy because they needed to protect their souls. And so they really emphasized what harms the soul is far worse than what kills the body. So when we look at these events during the Middle Ages, all these different inquisitions that happened, we acknowledge that there were regrettable methods used to defend the principles. And even today, if you look in the Catechism, number 2298 even talks about these things that happened during the inquisitions are regrettable, particularly the torture. It's regrettable. And today we'll acknowledge heresy is very dangerous but it's not something that, we, that needs to be punished with death. And no one should be coerced to believe anything. No one should be tortured to force a confession. But I think today when we look at heresy, we also have to recognize the landscape is very different today. Christianity has changed greatly. It's very different than what it was during the Middle Ages. I mean, today there are many people who hold heterodox beliefs that aren't necessarily willfully being heretics. They don't intend to, to be wrong. They don't really know any better. There's other barriers to them knowing the truth. So we have to keep that in mind when we're acknowledging heresy today. So we can acknowledge in the past the regrettable things that happened, but you know, I think what we can and should imitate from those who lived during the Middle Ages is their great faith, their proper ordering of life, and not only did they recognize the dangers of heresy, they recognized they had a duty to address it. And I think that this is really where we all have a role in today. Evangelization, in, in understanding our role and in, in helping other people come to know the truth. And so even though their methods at times were flawed, you, we can still uphold their principles today and we can still act on the same things they were acting on at that point. And just really imitating their great faith and how they saw the reality of life. <laughs>
So these are just a list of some of the references if you want to learn more. I have a few books over here if you want to look at those in a little while. Um, but there's a couple books. Edward Peters was a historian. Um, he wrote a really big book on the Inquisition that's very in-depth. He also wrote another book on torture, talks about the development of that in history. And then if you just want to look online, I put some of these authors' names. You can just put them in a, some type of browser to look for them. They have articles about the Inquisition. Then there's different books down here that have chapters on the Inquisition. So I'll leave this up and y'all can kind of get a list of some references that if you're interested in more things, y'all can look there. But hopefully tonight at least helped you to better understand the Inquisitions, what they mean, what happened, help you to be able to really determine facts and fictions when you're hearing someone talk about this period of time. So I will close with that and just see if there's any particular questions in the last few minutes that we have tonight. Any questions you'll have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned heresies today. What would be considered a heresy? How far would you extend? I mean, you mentioned Protestantism mm -hmm. was a heresy. Would you, would you still consider that a heresy today? What would yes. Be so, that are I mean, heresy is definitely something that um, where someone falls away from the faith. So the Lutheran ideas are heretical ideas. The l people who live that, so a lot of Lutherans today don't necessarily know they're heretics, they're not willfully heretics, but Lutheran ideas are heresies. Anything that is not consistent with what the church teaches, um, so, so a lot of, all the different Christian beliefs that are not in accord with the church teaches are heretical ideas. It doesn't mean those people are heretics because a lot of them don't know any better. They're not willfully, intentionally knowing the truth and then straying from it. Um, so th there's a little bit of a difference. I mean, there's, and there's a lot of different terms you can use and the catechism goes into a little bit schismatics versus heretics. Um, people who are like apostates completely fall away from the faith. But heresy is this idea of divisions in the faith, descent from the faith. So Lutheran ideas, Baptist ideas, evangelical ideas, the ideas are heretical because they're not true. But they're straying from the truth. So if that kind of answers it a little bit, but they're not necessarily heretics. Okay, so not really heretics, but those ideas are heretical, if that makes sense. Do we have any real heresies today? Well, I mean, those are all going to be heresies, but it's just, so things that aren't in accord with the truth, what the church teaches are heresies, but they're not all heretics. So people have to be willful heretics. I would say two of the biggest heresies today that the church deals with are modernism and relativism. Mm-hmm. Right. So, right. So anything that strays, you have the truth and what God's truths are, and anything that strays from that is heresy. Relativism, modernism, um, atheism, in a sense. Materialism. Yeah, I mean, everything that's really straying from the truth could fall into that category of these ideas that are, that are false, that are really dissenting from the truth and opposed from the truth. So there's a lot of heresies. It's just not everyone is a heretic who believes them because they're not willfully choosing to reject the truth, I guess, is probably the simplest way so to do it. you have to be a Catholic and then depart from that belief and try to espouse something else to become a... A yeah, I mean, in, a in a large sense. So, yes, if someone's if someone's baptized and and exposed to the church, and then they willfully reject the truth, knowing that they're willfully choosing to leave and reject it, it's just a gray area today because how much do people know? And like Edward Peters in one of his books even says, heresy is a very difficult thing to investigate because it's very intellectual. How much is that person culpable for knowing or not knowing? And so it's it's a very difficult. Um, process of determining if an individual person is a heretic, but we can identify heresies. They're all over. So anything that is opposed to the truth that the church teaches is a heresy, really. Um, but it's just the heretics. It's a more difficult uh, process to determine who is actually a heretic, but heresies are easy. Everything that's not in accord with the church teaches is a heresy, to put it simply.